The most common bleeding disorder in humans is hemophilia A, also known as classic hemophilia. Now, before we discuss this medical condition and before we actually discuss what causes it, let's remember the blood clotting cascade and what it actually is. Well, whenever there is some type of trauma inside our blood vessels, so for example, we have a cut or we have some type of rupture in the endothelium of a blood vessel in our cardiovascular system, that basically initiates the blood clotting cascade. And what the blood clotting cascade is and what it does is, so it basically consists of these many proteins and enzymes that work together to coordinate the formation of blood clots. And these blood clots are basically mesh-like networks of these individual fibrin molecules that basically create the mesh-like structure that ultimately forms the blood clots. And these blood clots can basically coagulate and they can seal off that rupture, that cut, and that prevents the leakage of blood out of that blood vessel and into that surrounding tissue. Now, if we actually examine the blood clotting cascade, we'll see that there are two important pathways. We have the extrinsic pathway and we have the intrinsic pathway. So let's begin by focusing briefly on the extrinsic pathway. So in the extrinsic pathway, what happens is once we have the cut in the endothelium of the blood vessel, that exposes an important integral glycoprotein that wasn't there before. And this is known as TF, which stands for tissue factor. Now, everything shown in this diagram that is purple, that basically describes a protein that is not an enzyme. And so the tissue factor is not an actual enzyme. It's simply a glycoprotein that exists on the membrane of the, endo <clears throat> of the endothelium. Now, once this is exposed inside the blood plasma, we have this zymogen we call factor seven. And once this is exposed, factor seven is basically activated via proteolytic cleavage. And once we activate factor seven, it goes on, it interacts and binds to the tissue factor to form a dimer complex. And then the dimer complex, it interacts with a very important factor uh, factor X, factor 10, to basically proteolytically cleave it and activate it into its active form. So the red one is the active form of factor 10. So everything shown in blue is an enzyme, but it exists in its zymogen inactive form. The red molecules are those enzymes in their fully active form. So blue means inactive zymogen and red means fully active. And so once these two interact, they go on to activate this one into its fully functional and active factor 10. Now, once we form factor 10, factor 10 basically combines and interacts with another protein called factor 5. And once they form that complex, that basically goes on and activates another important molecule we call prothrombin. And this is what we spoke of earlier. So basically, prothrombin is activated into thrombin. And then, and, and then it's this thrombin that basically goes on via the common pathway or the final common pathway to ultimately form this mesh-like network of fibrin we call blood clots because thrombin activates fibrinogen into fibrin monomers and the and then these fibrin monomers basically aggregate they, they form these clusters that form our blood clots now thrombin is also important because it actually goes back and creates many different positive feedback loops as we'll see in just a moment and that amplifies the effect now, let's look at the intrinsic pathway because ultimately, it's the intrinsic pathway that is affected by this medical condition we call hemophilia A. So in the intrinsic pathway, following the exposure of the surrounding tissue, following that cut in the blood vessel, that basically stimulates the, uh, the proteolytic activation of factor 12. And then once factor 12 is activated, it goes on to proteolytically activate factor 11 and that goes on to proteolytically activate factor 9. Now factor 9 cannot by itself activate factor 10. What must happen is this 
a protein that is not an enzyme, so factor H, basically interacts and stimulates this factor 9 to go on and activate factor 10. And so ultimately what we see is this is the converging point of these two pathways. And these two pathways basically ultimately do the same exact thing. They basically activate factor 10 which is needed to basically initiate the final common pathway that is needed to actually stimulate the activation of thrombin which is then used to stimulate the activation of fibrin and these fibrin molecules basically form this mesh like aggregate so these are the individual fibrin monomers and they basically aggregate spontaneously following activation to form our blood clot and the blood clot is used to basically coagulate the blood to form those clots on those cuts to basically prevent the leakage of blood out of that blood vessel. Now, as I mentioned earlier, thrombin basically creates various different types of feedback loops. And one of these positive feedback loops is shown on the board with the green arrow. So what happens is, once thrombin is activated, it not only activates fibrinogen to form fibrin, it also goes back and stimulates factor A to basically continue to interact with factor 9 to basically stimulate or to basically convert even more of these factor X inactive zymogen factor 10 into the active form. And so these two pathways along with all these different types of positive feedback loops basically greatly amplify the number of blood clots that we form. And so what happens is because of the quickness and the efficiency of this blood clotting cascade as a result of the correct functioning of all these different proteins and enzymes and pathways, we're actually able to actually quickly seal off that cut, that rupture in the blood vessel. Now, what happens in hemophilia is, as I mentioned earlier, it's the intrinsic pathway that is actually impeded, that is actually affected. And to be more specific, it's factor A that is affected as a result of hemophilia. And that's exactly why factor 8 is also commonly known as the anti-hemophilic factor. And that's because if this anti-hemophilic factor is actually present and functions correctly inside our body, then that will prevent hemophilia A, also known as classic hemophilia. So factor 8 is a protein that plays the crucial role in the intrinsic pathway of the blood clotting cascade. And there are two important roles as we discussed just a moment ago. So role number one is it actually plays an important role in actually completing the intrinsic pathway. So we see that at the final step of the intrinsic pathway, it's this anti-hemophilic factor, factor A, that must stimulate, interact with this factor 9 to basically go on and convert the zymogen factor 10 form into its active form. Now, now, if this molecule is destroyed, if there's some type of mutation or if it's missing altogether, then this will not be stimulated and will not be able to actually activate this factor 10. And so if that doesn't take place, then the entire intrinsic pathway basically slows down its impaired. And what that means is, we will not amplify the effects. The formation of the blood clots, we're not going to be able to form as many blood clots as we want. We're not going to be able to form them quickly enough. And so that will result in excessive bleeding. Now, the other reason why the impairment of this factor eight is so, uh, so negative is because thrombin actually uses this to create a very important positive feedback loop as we discussed just a moment ago. So thrombin essentially depends on factor 8, on the presence of factor 8 to create the positive feedback loop that greatly amplifies the number of factor 10 that we actually activate. And that in turn amplifies how much of the blood clots we actually can form, how many of the blood clots we can form. So Two important functions of factor eight. 
FACTA8 interacts with proteolytic enzyme FACTA9 and stimulates it to basically go on and activate FACTA10, which is needed to ultimately coagulate the blood and form the blood clots because it's this molecule, FACTA10, that initiates the final common pathway that is used to form those blood clots. And the second important function of FACTA8 is uh, thrombin creates a positive feedback loop stimulating FACTA8 swimming around in the blood to interact with FACTA9 which causes an amplification effect and this is basically this positive feedback loop that I just discussed just a moment ago. So we basically see that in individuals with classic hemophilia, there is some type of mutation in factor 8, or in some cases, factor 8 is missing entirely. And so what that means is the impairment of factor 8 greatly impedes this process, the intrinsic pathway. And if the intrinsic pathway does not function properly, we cannot amplify, we cannot create these blood clots quickly enough. And so what that means is once the blood vessel actually is cut, once the endothelium ruptures, the blood clots do not form at a high enough rate and so excessive bleeding may occur. And this is exactly why hemophilia A is a bleeding disorder. Order. So, in individuals with hemophilia A, when they essentially uh, when they essentially cut a blood vessel, this is basically what takes place, and this is why it actually takes place. And the final thing I'd like to mention is, as you might know from basic biology, hemophilia A is actually a sex-linked recessive trait. And that's exactly why male individuals basically are those that have and express the hemophilia A. Because it's a sex-linked recessive trait, if an individual that is a female contains a, a um, one dominant trait and one recessive trait, that dominant trait will basically overpower that recessive trait. And so a heterozygous female individual, even though she will be a carrier, she will not actually express this medical condition because she will have the gene to actually produce that fully functional uh, factor 8 anti-hemophilic factor protein that is actually responsible for finishing off that intrinsic pathway.